Praise the Lord. Welcome to Faith Challenge, Outreach Ministry of Grace Family Bible Church, 2056 Genesee Street in the beautiful city of Buffalo, New York. We're glad to have you here today Bible studying your Bibles with us. We hope you have your pens and papers because this half hour goes by very, very fast. And we just want to try to enrich your life with the word of God so that you can be spiritually nurtured. And if you're not saved, that you can, um, you know, understand about the salvation that God provides through his son, Jesus Christ, how he allowed him to die for our sins and was buried and he rose on the third day according to the scriptures and putting your faith and trust in that producing salvation in your life. Today we're going to talk about uh, the dictionary of our gospel. And the reason I say dictionary of our gospel because our doc doctrine or in our gospel has intricate terms in it that really allow us to understand our gospel and our good news to the extent that we can convey it and communicate it to others as well as appreciate it for ourselves because the good news is in fact what motivates us the bible talks about how it's the love of christ that constrains us and god conveys his love towards us through the words that are uh conveyed or communicated to us through his words so we want to begin to understand some of these key words and these key terms that are associated with our gospel when we look at this we can just say you know it's like a paper boy standing on the street corner he can yell good news good news and uh it might sell a few papers you know because when you say good news good news people like good news but if he really wanted to sell a few more papers he might say good news good news read all about it a man uh, invents a cure for old age and the specificness of that idea of that he uh added the idea of somebody invented something for old age a lot of individuals would cling and draw to that because how many people don't want to try to get a remedy for old age so when he adds the details of the good news it begins to enrich the the, the hearer and the person is more interested in what's being said and he'll sell a, a whole lot more papers by doing so and this is what we want to convey and express to you today our in the, our gospel has some good news that's underlined in it that once we begin to share some of the terms with it some of the details it will cause you to be more enthused about it more enthused about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ and it'll give you an opportunity to understand it to the extent that you can share this message with others now I wrote some notes today so you'll see me kind of straying away I'm trying to stay on form because we're going to do a systematic study over a period of few weeks that pertain to the dictionary of our gospel and it's going to take maybe about three to four weeks um, hopefully we can get the, these terms put out so if you have your DVR try to tape us for the next three or four weeks so we can get through this but we pretty much going to go through the introduction of this and this particular study is started by a brother of mine Dave Dow he actually wrote a book talking about some of these terms and of the dictionary of the gospel so I want to kind of give him his credit I don't want to try to think that I'm plagiarizing anything but you know it just enriched so many of us that we all kind of branched out and, and can began to show things and, and, and study it and, and share that information in a lot of different ways and that would be the purpose of this study no not to sell papers but to inform you in a specific way about the good news that affects your eternal destiny and this is what I want to talk about do you know that you have an eternal destiny and a lot of people don't realize that whether you're you're a believer or an unbeliever you have an eternal destiny and we're going to go to our Bibles with this one in a moment let's go to uh, mark the ninth chapter because a lot of people don't understand about this eternal destiny Jesus in his earthly ministry when he came to confirm the promises to Israel he talked about this eternal destiny a lot of people have different views on this but this is why we say what we say now we use all the Bible all the Bible is for us and it gives us information pertaining to things of this life before this life and even after this life in this realm of our reality and in the realm of spirituality and Jesus Christ in this earthly ministry dealt gave us some information concerning after death you know and different things like that turn to Mark 9 we're gonna look about the 42nd chapter and we're gonna look at that I actually have it queued up on screen so the Bible camera have you all set there verse 42 it says, and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe, we're on the Bible cam, little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and were cast into the sea. Now look what it goes on to say, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never quench never shall be quenched now a lot of people we can stay bible cam there a lot of individuals have a a a, a, 
a different view on what that hell is there. But where, whatever that hell is, you don't want to be a part of it, whether it's Haiti, Sheol, Sheol how, you know, whichever uh, terminology you want to use with that. This particular hell that is expressed in the Bible is a, is a, a place of punishment. Now, look what it goes on to say, because hell in and of itself is temporary. Hell in itself shall be cast into the lake of fire. But look at this. It says where there worm verse 44 where their worm dieth not and their fire is not quenched so therefore even if hell was a temporary place that came to an end the bible is very clear that their fire is not quenched and i understand why because death and hell shall be cast into the lake of fire and the lake of fire is eternal go to verse 47 and if thine eye offend thee pluck it out it is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where the worm dieth not and their fire again is not quenched. Jesus Christ keeps reiterating this in his earthly ministry that this idea of an individual being outside of the will of God and doing something in this case, he says, um, to offend the little ones. And actually, he's talking about that little flock there. He's making a reference to um, an individual eternity is going to be clogged out for him. I'm going to go to the board here because this is what I want to talk to you about eternal destiny. When you're talking about eternal destiny, as we have the board, you have an opportunity right now to trust in what God is providing for you through this good news that we're talking about. That all oh, this is the dictionary of the gospel. The good news only means gospel. When you believe or accept this gospel, the requirement of with this gospel is just to believe it. It produces eternal life with eternal look, glory. It's incorruptible. But now you don't have to do anything. If you don't believe, you're an unbeliever. So it's not like you had a fork in the road. Your destiny is here. Eternal damnation. And you heard what that passage says, where the worm dieth not. What happens is you corrupt. You ever put um, meat in the um, garbage can on a hot summer day? You let it sit there for about two or three days. That meat starts to corrupt. That's what we're talking about corruption. It starts to corrupt. And you know what comes off of it? These worms. We call them maggots. Do you know in the de-evolution of man, they're going to affirm that the Bible is letting us know that. Our form, if you don't accept what God has provided for you, you're going to devolve. And in your corruption, God has a worm that is going to be conditioned to endure eternal punishment. Ooh, people don't like that. I don't even talk about punishment too much because, uh, you know, we preach grace of God and all that. And all you have to do to avoid this is the trust in the fact that Christ died for your sins, according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. But it's a reality. And we teach that right over the Bible. That's Mark 9. It's a lot of other places, but that's actually not today's show. But I just chose to show you out of Mark 9 because so many of you do prescribe to what Jesus says. So I use an area of scripture of Jesus in his earthly ministry to validate the idea of um, the reality of the fact that there is an eternal damn a place of eternal damnation. Whether you believe in hell or not, um, it's very clear that eternal damnation is, is lying in store for an individual who is not willing to prepare to trust in this good news. And that's why we're talking about the good news. We don't want to talk about the idea of eternal damnation, eternal hell, where your worm dies. Not we want to talk about the good news. So the eternal destiny of all humanity, they all have eternal existence. However, they still can influence where they spend their eternity and you can influence it by whether you're going to trust in what God provided for you or you're just going to ignore what God provided for you. You see, the term gospel means good news. That's simply what we're saying. The gospel is good news. The good news is that you don't have to um, be suspended in that idea of eternal damnation. The good news will we will be making a reference to is God's good news. Our gospel to us is about an opportunity of have give, God has given us for eternal life. And this is what we talk about all every show. We're always talking about that gospel. The fact that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day according to scriptures. There are many messages of good news in the Bible, but the message of good news for this present age is the good news that God has provided for everyone a free, total, and complete salvation from our sins. And, and that's provided through there. It's complete, it's total, it's free. 
he, he, he starts it. He finishes it. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He, he doesn't allow us to mess it up. The Bible says once we trust in him, he seals us until the day of uh, redemption. And there's so many terms. These are some of those terms we're about to get into, hopefully, um, in these coming weeks so that we can definitely begin to express this to you. The book of Romans in the Bible is a great explanation of how this salvation was accomplished. But the simplicity of that gospel, however, is found in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter um, three and four. And the book of Romans is where we're going to get most of those terms from out of the book of Romans. Uh, the, a lot of these great terms that we're going to be talking about are going to continue to come up over and over again. And we'll be able to use that. However, involved in the death, burial and resurrection was a very precise, strategic and technical accomplishment of victory that God won over sin, death and Satan. And these are the enemies that we had. And, we, you know, we talked about in a couple a few weeks ago how in uh, once Adam had sinned, this law came into the earth of sin and death. The soul that sinneth shall surely die. And it was almost like the law of gravity. And what God done accomplished for us through through the gospel, through the good news of the finished work of Jesus Christ. He won the victory over sin. He won the victory over death. Ultimately he wins the victory over Satan because Satan is the one who caused man to fall. Now, God's desire for us is to know and understand and appreciate this good news. For that reason, the book of Romans used particular terms that when understood, it thrills the heart and transforms the mind of the believer. When these terms are not understood, it results in confusion. Romans 3, 21 through 28 proclaims the good news of our salvation using doctrine field, which um, such terms as righteousness, imputation, justification, Grace, redemption, propitiation, faith, remission, forbearance, reconciliation and sanctification. Now, over the coming weeks, we're going to deal. We're going to talk about all of these terms. These terms are crucial to your understanding. You have to know these terms in order to really be able to effectively communicate, not only share with others, but to understand what God has done for you. And, you know, there's there's a lot that God has done for us in our salvation that we really don't get a chance to fully um, express or fully um, uh, take advantage of from a vantage point of knowing so that we can live a life of of appreciation toward God and, and, and live a, a life of gratitude towards God. We never really get an op opportunity to to live our salvation out based upon knowledge. And the one thing about our Christian life today, it cannot operate on the basis of ignorance. That's why the word of God says, knowing this, you need to know this, knowing this, because these things are things of our, our mind. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And our mind is exactly what God has in store for us uh, to restore us in order for us to live a life on this earth that is going to be pleasing to God. Now, a couple of those terms that we just threw out there are found in other areas of the scripture, but uh, eight out of that 10 or eight, six out of that eight rather are, are found right in the Pauline epistles. And they're all going to be included in our salvation study. And the reason that we have in this study on the dictionary of our gospel, and we're going to lay out all these different terms because there's so much confusion in Christendom about our salvation as a whole. And I find that a lot of people are spiritual and they study their Bibles and different things like that. But when you don't study the Bible um, rightly divided and you don't really get an opportunity to uh, uh, lay these things out and lay these terms out, there's going to be always these cluster of questions that always remain. And there's going to be great confusion amongst even people that name Christ, you know. People say that they're Christian or and, and I don't anytime somebody tells me that, they, you know, that they 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 study that they follow after the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And I say that, you know, because that 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 has an umbrella of a lot of different faiths and a lot of different belief groups within it. If they tell me that they're prescribed to that, that Bible, that foundation is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, uh, which is, you know, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible that we know. Um, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is actually listed in. If they tell me that they have any parts of that Bible, 
I, I don't dare to question whether or not they're saved because within the confines of that word is the message of salvation. And it simply implies that they put their trust in what God has provided for them. And, and no man knows. I can't judge whether another individual is saved based upon looking at them, looking at their performance, looking at their works, looking at their deeds. We we don't judge another man's servant. You know what I mean? And, and, and they're the servant of God, whether they're living a life that's worthy of the calling or not. That's not what that's not up to us to decide. Um, another thing that we say there is much confusion in Christian about these questions. Um, first question is, is a person saved through faith alone? Now, if you study the Bible and you, you're curious about any type of spiritual things, that's a good question that should come up. But once you study the gospel, we deal with these terms um, over these coming weeks. This this particular question should be um, fulfilled. It should come to a fruition of understanding in your ears. Another question that should come to a, a great understanding with you is our works are part of our salvation. How many times have you ever seen, uh, heard that people say that faith without works is dead? You know what I mean? Sometimes people say, yeah, I'm, I'm saved, but you can't say you're saved if you're not if you don't have these works to go along with it. So uh, the question comes up. Our works are part of our salvation or our works are part of what we do because we are saved. Those questions. Are, are going to be answered over these coming weeks. Can a person know for sure he is saved? You know, wouldn't you like to know for sure that you're saved instead of guessing? You're getting up going to church every Sunday and you're getting up going to wherever uh, assembly or association that you that you are part of. But you're not quite sure. You're not quite sure if you happen to die right now or if you happen to die tomorrow, whether or not you're going to spend eternity in, in the position with God that your hope has rested in. And a lot of us have different hopes. We looking at the same Bible, but one man's hope might be with spending God with eternity with God. One man's hope may be um, to spend eternity uh, in, in, as an angel transformed to an angel. He believes another man's hope is that he stays right here on earth and God reconditions the earth and, and restores the earth. So, you know, no matter what your particular hope, uh, if you passed away right now, do you believe that you would embark or be a part of that hope? This is something that you have to know within your mind today. And these questions shall be um, um, uh, come to fruition in your ear. They should come. You should get an understanding of some of these questions. The fourth question is, what if a person sins again after being saved? I mean, these are very typical questions and they're questions that have been, you know, quite uh, explored over and over again. But people ask them over and over again because they never get a satisfactory answer. And a lot of times they don't get a satisfactory answer is because when they study their Bibles, they're not studying it from the vantage point of, of rightly dividing it. So they'll add two areas of scriptures together to actually contradict each other in the Bible. It's very clear when you try to add two things that contradict each other. The Bible says a double mind that'll create double mindedness. And the Bible says that a double minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So that will cause you to be unstable in all your ways. And last and not least, the fifth question that we should you should get an answer to after we complete this study in the coming weeks is can a person lose their salvation and we've talked about that many 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 times on this particular ministry in this broadcast can a person lose his salvation and, and do you know whether or not you know is it something that you think you possibly can have be a part of what god is doing today and then tomorrow no longer be a part of god today you can be a son of god or a daughter of god however you want to express it but then god kicks you out of his family or discommunicates you or cuts your fellowship off with them. Do you believe or perceive based upon your persuasion or your faith or the way that you study the, the Bible? Is that something that can happen? Well, that's why we are going to be looking at the dictionary of our gospel. The dictionary of our gospel is going to give us all those terms. It's going to express to us all those terms that are going to be needed in order for us to go to the next level in our understanding concerning our gospel and you need to know these things because not only are you asking them for yourself a lot of people are asking them of you and if you're not uh studying your bible you don't know the answer to a lot of these things and that's what god would have you know the answer to a lot of these questions and all these questions can be answered simply just by understanding the meaning of the words that we are going to um, be talking about over the show uh, um, over the, over the uh, over the time of this particular show, but I want to show you a passage here over here in the book of Romans. In the book of Romans, before we close out, because this is something that's so unique to 
what we talk about um, oftentimes. There's so much, you know, in, in the word of God that begins to give us an idea of, of some of the things that God has done for us. Look over here in Romans, the fifth chapter and the ninth verse. Look what it says here. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And a lot of individuals, you know, you know, you talk about these terms justified and, and different things, and they're going to be blasting all over the page in these coming weeks. Uh, it says uh, that we're going to that you will which you shall be saved from wrath through him. The wrath of God um, is definitely a reality. And the fact of the matter is the good news. And that's what we keep talking about, the gospel, which is simply the good news. The good news is that you no longer have to worry about the wrath of God being poured out on you because the wrath of God, the punishment that God wanted to exact upon sin and upon evil doers was exacted or poured out upon his son Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. And this is and, the, and this is the reason why he can turn around and give you the good is because he gave Jesus Christ the bad. And don't don't think of that as a bad thing. It was all in God's plan that he would allow Jesus Christ to live that 100 percent sinless life on our behalf and then punish Jesus Christ and give Jesus Christ our uh, punishment and our penalty so that we could receive his uh, righteousness without our ability to do because we were without strength. That's what it makes a reference to. Look what it says there in verse six of Romans, the five, ch fifth chapter. It says, therefore, when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. This is the good news. We're going to talk about the good news in our gospel here. And the good news, the fact of the matter is, is that we didn't have strength to do anything. And Christ died for us in that particular state that we were in. So don't think that you you you, you prescribed to God, you did something for God. Um, God uh, looked at you and was pleased with some of the things that you were doing. And he began to uh, enjoy and appreciate so much what you were doing that he, 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 he had mercy upon you. The only reason that God could uh, could afford us the salvation that we actually have today is because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Look at verse seven. For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet per uh, per venture or perhaps a good man, some would even dare die. But God commended or showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you realize that if Christ did all of that while you were yet sinners, how much more then will he do for you the moment you trust and believe in what his son accomplished for you in Jesus Christ, I mean, on Calvary's cross? This is something that's very important. You know, uh, before we begin our definitions, I want you to be aware of another reason why there is so much confusion in Christendom. The problem is that people read their Bible too superstitiously, thinking wherever they read, whatever they read and what was what God is saying to them. But that is not so. Confusion begins in not paying attention to who is being addressed in the passage of the Bible and then not believing that when God addresses Israel, he actually means Israel. You know, my uncle, one of my uncles, he passed away now, but he used to tell us, "Boy, if you ever want to get a word from God. And something is going on in your life. You just grab God's word. You get God's Bible. Then you close your eyes. You close your eyes and you place it on something firmly. And then you just split it open. And you take your finger and you just put it down there and you come to it. And God is going to speak to you through his word. And in this particular case, the verse says, and he said unto me, who art thou? And I answered him, I am Amalek, an Amalekite. And somehow he would take that and run with it to make it fit his particular situation. He could have just found out he had malaria or or cancer or anything. But that particular verse was supposed to answer his particular um, frailty or his particular uh, situation before God. And a lot of times because we study the Bible with some so much of these superstitious um, ways, you know, God's word is not being properly expressed to us. It's not being conveyed properly. And, you know, if it's your uncle, you that sometimes if you don't ever study to show thyself approved unto God as a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing word of truth, you continue the traditions of that foolishness that somebody else may have showed you. 
You know, so I mean, some of these things that we have to take for, you know, we have to take to heart. If that's something that you're doing, you need to begin to take a look at it. That's not how you studied God's word, you know, and, and God doesn't get the glory of. There is a portion of the Bible that specifically addresses us Gentiles and the Jews and the Jews of this age. And this book and these books are found in the Romans to Philemon. Now, let's see how knowing this fact clears up much of the confusion. Now, we talk about this quite a bit on this particular ministry, uh, how we make this distinction between the area of scripture, Romans through Philemon. Now, within Romans to Philemon, if you're familiar with the Bible, you'll understand that when I, the Romans through Philemon is, are the Pauline epistles. And within the Pauline epistles, there's something that's called progressive revelation. So you'll understand that. And we'll get into all of those different things because most of our terminology that I made a reference to today you'll see are going to come out of those books or Romans to Philemon. It is commonly taught that there is only one gospel in the Bible. I'm not speaking of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are sometimes called the four gospels. I'm talking about the proclamation of the gospel that is in the Bible. You know, a lot of people think well, every time you say gospel, they go, oh, you're talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Gospel means good news. And when we're saying good news, we're talking about the good news of this age today to you. What is God's good news? Does God have any good news for us on earth today? That's what I'm saying. Does the Bible contain any good news? Is there anything good that's going to come out of this Bible that's pro that's to us that can be applied to us today? Not like I say my uncle just wanted to point and say something out. He might got lucky and pointed in the right spot a few times. But in most cases, you point at areas of scripture that's just aimless, you know, to have absolutely no meaning in our lives today. Many, in fact, most believe that all the New Testament preachers, John the Baptist, Jesus, the 12 apostles, Apostle Paul, preached the same gospel. This is totally unscriptural. The Bible speaks of several different gospels in the in the word of God. And you have to be aware of that. So just because I'm saying the dictionary of our gospel, that's why I said our gospel, because it implies that there's a particular gospel that comes to us that deals with our particular situation today. And in time past, there was a lot of different gospels. There's the gospel of the kingdom. There's the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of peace, the everlasting gospel, the gospel of the circumcision, the gospel of the uncircumcision. So there's a lot of gospels in the scriptures that we're going to have to evaluate and be able to um, rightly divide in order for you to see which gospel applies to what God is doing for you and I today. Now, I know I hope that I'm not getting too literal for you today, but I hope if you watch this particular uh, ministry over the next few weeks, that you'll get a better understanding of what God is expressing. When we begin to lay these terms out, these terms are going to really begin to uh, enlighten you and, uh, and express to you all the goodness that God has in store for you, because this this word is explosive. And I just want you to be able to ex uh, to ex 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 experience it in a way that God can get the glory out of your life. God wants you to be able to understand all the good things that he's provided for you through Jesus Christ so that you'll have that at the attitude of gratitude. I like to say it because that's going to be the motivating factor in your life. You're going to be so appreciative, so grateful for what God is doing for you and has done for you through what he's uh, through Jesus Christ, that it's going to be your springboard or your foundation on why you live a life of gratitude and uh, of, of goodness towards others. You're going to treat others good because you'll see the goodness that God has expressed to you through the finished work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I ask you to stay tuned these coming weeks as we uh, begin to go through the different uh, uh, term, terms that we have. And we're going to have a, diff a lot of different terms for you as we go, you know, from week to week. And these terms are going to be laid out on the board. We're going to have them at the bottom of the screen. We're going to give you the verses so that you can point them out in the Bible and study along with your family so that you can have a very sound understanding of the different terminologies that are expressed in our gospel. We just thank you for listening every Tuesday at 530 on Channel 20 in uh, Buffalo and suburbs of Channel 20 also. Wednesdays, we're on suburbs at 6.30 and um, 5.30 Tuesdays in the city. We actually have an additional showing on Friday nights at 11 o'clock. We ask you to, I mean, not, not Friday night, Friday morning at 11 o'clock. We ask you to stay tuned. We're more than glad to have you, and we just ask you to keep continuing to watch Faith Challenge. We're truly glad to have you. God bless you. Maranatha, thanks for watching Faith Challenge.